Hi, welcome to another great session at Idea Gen's Acceleration Summit. My name is Jane Oates. I'm the president of Working Nation, a nonprofit media entity, and also the proud co chair of the Washington Baltimore region for Idea Gen. I'm really excited to bring you this session. Uh, it's going to teach you things that you didn't know and show you how education and corporations are really working so well together. To do that, I'm going to introduce you to Jeannie Contardo, who's the head of CoLab, which is a program run by the Greater Washington Partnership. Jeannie? Hi, Jane. So great to be here today. It's always so great to see you and have you. I wish we were together. But I want you to start by introducing yourself a little bit about talking about your journey, and then we'll dig into CoLab. Sure. I'm Jeannie Contardo. I am the Vice President and Managing Director of the Capital CoLab. I came to this role a couple of years ago. I'd had my own consulting business. My background is actually in higher education. I earned my doctorate at the University of Maryland and um, have always for the past two decades worked at this space between business and education, um, engaging in really what I, what I consider to be a translational exercise. So what business needs from the education sector is different sometimes than how education thinks of itself. And so helping to be that translation expert who makes sure that educators and businesses are communicating effectively and getting the joint outcomes they want is really at the core of my career. And, and is really just, the I think right now in this country, one of the most exciting places to be. Well, and you're the person to be running this because you are uh, saying you're an expert is understating it. So, so thrilled to have you. So let's talk a little bit. The Greater Washington Partnership, first of all, is a partnership of local governments and businesses from basically Baltimore to Richmond, right? I mean, that's or that's the collab. That, that's correct. So the, the Greater Washington Partnership came about about five years ago from the region's CEOs of the largest employers in the region who came together and said, you know, we really need to imagine rather than thinking of this area as separate cities in the case of the District of Columbia or separate states, we really need to recognize that 50 percent of the people in this region are crossing a jurisdictional boundary every single day, which means that they're moving from Maryland to Virginia to D.C., sometimes back again. And so in order to actually capitalize on all of the many wealths of this region, we need to think of it as a mega region where, where people and transit systems and housing and everything is playing in concert. And actually skills and talent then, which is the capital collab portfolio becomes a really key part of that because we know that the jobs are across this entire region and that people will move for them, but sometimes they'll just move for the day. And so we need to we need to make sure that we're building a robust ecosystem of talent. And that's really where the Capital Collab came into play. So uh, let's talk about Capital Collab. It is definitely your portfolio, as it should be, is education. And it's education from K-12 to two-year colleges to four-year colleges, right? Talk a little bit about that. That's absolutely right. So the Capital Collab came about three years ago, really to address what we see as being this sort of fundamental, sometimes confusing situation that employers and educators find themselves in, where employers are saying, I'm not getting what I need from the education system. And educators are saying, well, you're not really telling me with enough specificity and you're not supporting me the way I need to in order to be able to produce the education talent that you need. So maybe we can do something about that. So CoLab then exists in that space in between it. We are focused on digital tech talent. So the, the reason for focusing on digital tech was really because when our CEOs came together and started looking at the key element that they felt they were going to need in order to be successful in this region, the digital tech workforce was really the one that was keeping them up at night. So this is both the workforce that is in the form of engineers and computer scientists and cybersecurity experts and data analysts, but also all of those other people that work in what we consider tech adjacent roles, which are communications experts, HR experts, financial experts, people who need to be able to touch all of these digital tech fields, but don't necessarily need to be the experts. So the Capital CoLab was really created then to fix and to streamline this system, to ensure that employers were speaking with one voice about what it is they actually need in digital tech fields, and that educators then were hearing that one voice 
and able to embed that knowledge into their curriculum. So today we have 18 of the largest employers in the region participating in the Capital Collab, and we have 20 universities who are actively mapping their curriculum to what these employers have said they need in digital tech fields. We also have, as Jane said, a number of K-12 and community college partners at the table. And so we believe that it really is going to require an ecosystem play in order to think about this. And we all we often talk at the Collab about walking and chewing gum at the same time. So we know that there are immediate workforce needs and we need to be focusing on entry level talent right now because we need people to get into this workforce. And so our universities are working on cranking out graduates really quickly that have this education that we know is so necessary for the workforce. But our K-12 partners and our community college partners are some of the ones who are thinking about what where when we back up and start a little earlier, where do we need to be educating students so that they get on a pathway so that when they're ready, they're able to enter digital tech fields. So we really are focused both on preparing people for right now and also beginning to get to some of these students when they're a little younger so that we can get them into those pipelines so that they're ready to go in three, four, five, six years. Well, and we could spend hours because the between the K-12 partnerships and the community college partnerships, there's so much going on. But I asked you if we could concentrate today on the partnership with four-year institutions, only because, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that for many of our viewers, uh, they have seen really great community college partnerships. They've seen K-12 programs like Tech, you know, that get kids or, or the career and education programs that exist in so many A12 systems. They've seen that there. But when you talk about four-year institutions, particularly some of the four-year institutions that you've attracted, they don't see them as connecting as agilely, as as enthusiastically with the world of work. So first, let's talk a little bit about who some of your four-year partners are and who some of your partners uh, are. Great. So thank you for that um, focus on this conversation. You're right that we this program really started as a university partnership. And it's been just an incredible, incredible effort. We started with 12 universities and it had some of the usual suspects that you would expect to see in this region. So we had UVA and Virginia Tech and Georgetown and University of Maryland. And over the years, um, we've been adding some of the more non-traditional suspects that you that are incredible assets in this community. So to be very, very clear, we've been very, very fortunate in the robust group of university partners we've been able to bring to this table. Some of the ones that, especially if you're listening to this from around the, around the country or around the world that you may not have heard of, but I think deserve special shout outs, George Mason was our first adopter. George Mason University located in Virginia and um, has just been an incredible partner at really thinking creatively in terms of how to engage diverse students in this digital tech pipeline, how to make sure that we are building multiple pathways so not every student takes the same path to get into a career. Um, other universities that I think, again, are, are newer and maybe you won't have heard of if you're not from this region, Trinity Washington University um, is based in the District of Columbia and is a recent new member to the collab. Marymount University is based in Virginia and is a Hispanic serving institution. We have a number of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities that are engaged in our efforts. And so a key, a key piece of our work that I think is really key is that when we look at traditional hiring patterns, especially from some of the largest employers in the region, they have their recruiting structures in place. And so they, they know how to go to that handful of universities that they've always recruited from. And, and they will continue to go to those universities, I would expect. But what they're trying to do is figure out ways how to both grow their pipeline, talent, pipeline of talent, but also how to diversify it. And so that means they have to think about accessing different post-secondary institutions to create this talent. So that's where the capital collab really comes in because we're bringing in partners that maybe traditionally some of our largest employers haven't been sourcing talent from. And so this is an opportunity for them to think, oh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is a great partner of ours in HBCU. And they're, they're currently working on their machine learning pathway. 
And so making sure that students who are going through University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where Mer many of our largest employers may not have been traditionally recruiting from them, but all of those students who are going through that pathway will have the knowledge, skills, and abilities in machine learning and AI that all of our employers have said they needed. So again, if they earn that digital tech credential in machine learning, they can be able to work at any of these organizations across the region where those skills are in demand. So we've just been really, really excited about the, the scalability factor of this program and our, our goals for the region. We've said by 2025, we're going to engage 45,000 learners in digital tech pathways, and at least 50% of them will be from underrepresented populations. So this is, this is a pretty significant number. But when you think about having 20 universities universities at the table moving students through their aligned pathways, I think this is a very achievable number and I'm really, really excited to see where we're going to end up. Um, on the employer side of the house, some of the employees, you will have heard of all of them. So I'm going to tick through some of the names in no particular order, but all of these are employers that across the world you will have heard of. So Amazon is one of our one of our key employers and one of their leading executives is a member of my advisory committee. Booz Allen Hamilton, Capital One, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, General Dynamics, Innova, JP Morgan Chase. I'm really just going down the list actually. McKinsey, MedStar, Microsoft, Monumental Sports and Entertainment, Northrop Grumman, Stanley Black & Decker, and T. Rowe Price. So that's our that's our um, list of the most engaged members that we have. And again, you've heard of you've heard of all of them. These are um, incredibly diverse companies. We obviously have some large government contractors, but we also have um, ones that are a little bit different in terms of how you think about the workforce. So Stanley Black and Decker, which has traditionally been in more of a, a manufacturing and tools space, and they're doing incredible work and have been incredible partners as we think about making sure that we're building this diverse digital tech pipeline. Um, monumental sports and entertainment. I mean, we're talking professional sports teams, uh, but they need, especially when it comes to data analytics, they need experts as well who are able to track and understand all of the team trends and how do you communicate that out. So we've had just some, some really incredible partners from across the region who are all extremely hungry for this talent, but also extremely hungry to work together so that it's clear that they're not just getting talent for their own organizations, but they're actually working together to improve the entire ecosystem. And I think when we when we think about challenges, frankly, talent gaps that we have in this region that we have across this country are huge. When you think about challenges of this magnitude, you also need to think about solutions that are appropriately bold and, and audacious. And I think that's that's where the collab is trying to sit at this point in time. So let me ask a little bit about uh, anybody who's in HR and listen, knows how hard it is to turn the ship of higher ed. Uh, the uh, institutions, particularly institutions that you're talking about that have always been high quality, uh, don't want to make changes. How did you work to get this digital certificate that the employer said they would A, recognize and really needed that talent? How did it work at the educational institutions, at the universities? You know, the education institutions have been very, very hungry for this. And, and I think it's because they know that they're able to. Everyone, everyone knows that universities and employers build lots of one-to-one -on, one -one relationships. So absolutely, um, you know, a university might have a relationship with a handful of companies around a handful of issues. What this, what this group, what this program, the CoLab, tries to solve is really this concern around how do I actually scale? How do I make sure that I can access a large number of employers at the same time? And so that's really what we're doing. Higher education has um, been shockingly, shockingly open to this because you're right, Jane, I think higher ed can get a bad rap mm -hmm. um, in terms of being slow to move, being slow to pivot. But I also think that the whole world is watching right now. Um, everyone's awake. Everyone understands the imperative to be able to address this, these tech talent shortages that we're seeing um, and to make sure that we're seeing growth in an equitable way. So that's, that's the other piece is that as we look across this region, if we don't engage women and people of color in a meaningful and intentional way in the digital tech workforce, we're not going to, going to see the equitable growth that we know we need to have in this footprint, in this geographic region. And if we don't see that, then our businesses aren't going to be able to hire who they need and we're not going to have a thriving economy. So it does feel to me like there's sort of this perfect storm 
in a really good way where employers are really hungry for the talent and universities are recognizing that they need to begin to build their curriculum in ways that are really sending large numbers of people into the workforce. The other, the other program that I'm really excited about that the CoLab just launched with the help from our employers and from funders is a scholarship fund. And so one of the reasons I, I believe that the universities have been um, so eager to engage in this work is because we're putting our money where our mouths are in term, from, the, from the employer side of the house. So employers have come together and said, you know, we need to signal as a group that we really want women and diverse people to be engaging in digital tech pipelines. And so just last week, we announced a $5 million scholarship fund for students who are engaged in the digital tech credential program. And the idea there is that these are scholarships for women and minorities who wanna participate in digital tech fields. And any of our universities who currently have digital tech credential pathways mapped are eligible to access these funds for their students. And so this is again about operating at scale. This is about signaling to students across the region that employers want them in these pipelines, want them to participate in these education programs, and then want them to enter their workforce, you know, either at their individual organizations or to just stay in the region, because we know that to have a strong region, we need to have this robust ecosystem. So we expect that through 2025, we'll give away 2000 scholarships to women and minorities. And again, when universities are hearing this signal from employers, saying one, we're willing to tell you all together, we're willing to get on the same page about what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities we actually need in these digital tech fields. And two, we're really we're willing to support students. We're going to support up to 2,000 students who are, in these, who are in these pipelines to make sure that they're able to go to college and complete a digital tech credential. You know, I think those are, are really powerful signals and they would be hard to ignore from the higher ed side of things. The, the final piece that is just worth mentioning is that many of our employers do offer internships and other work-based learning for students who are involved in the digital tech credential. And so we know increasingly that that's the name of the game for students and that universities know that also. And so to the extent that we're able to provide customized programming opportunities for students to engage with employers through the Capital CoLab, that's that's really a draw at this point, um, I think for universities as they're, as they're coming on because students are so hungry for these opportunities. And such a great announcement. I just want to clarify for people that are listening. These scholarships are available, and this is a question mark at the end, for any student going through the credential links. Not So they don't have to major in computer science. They don't have to major in data analytics or finance. They can major in anything but just take the course progression to get these the, the, the digital credential. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's actually, Jane, the most exciting thing for me about the digital tech credential and the way we map it is we don't force it to be aligned with a particular major, a particular minor. We leave it up to the universities because the universities are the ones who are best poised to determine where a skill should be taught, what course it should be taught in. And, and as you said, what is that course progression? And, and so it's up to the universities to determine how that digital tech credential should be awarded. And you're right. I mean, I just, I just love the idea of a music major earning a digital tech credential in data analytics or, or um, you know, an art major or, or a physicist who says, you know, I really need to know something about cybersecurity because that wasn't necessarily something taught in my physics courses. So we just, we get so much opportunity to think creatively about how, how talent is created um, that I get, I get really jazzed as you can tell. Well, it's so true. I mean, we're not going to have the problems with AI if, a diverse group of people are creating the algorithms. A poet, a, a, certainly we need the computer science major, but I mean, and a coder, but this is gonna be better for everybody. Now I wanna ask you, cause I'm sure there are people listening that say, number one, I'm in that region, I'm an employer, can I join? Or I'm a university, I don't think I'm a member yet, can I join? What's the process? Will you still allow people to join you in this mission? Absolutely, there is plenty of work to go around. So thank you, thank you, Jane, for asking. So um, yes, if you'll allow me the commercial for a minute, if you think this is interesting to you, you certainly can go look at our website at capitalcolab.com, but you also can just send us an email at collab at greaterwashingtonpartnership.com and we will, we will have a conversation with you and talk about on the employer side of the house, we'll talk about what are the employer um, commitments. And this is, this is very much, I laugh, it's a, it's a working partnership. And so we love engaging with our employers, making sure that we're 
solving the right problem. Um, and problems evolve and problems shift. And so we need to make sure that we're in touch with each other um, and engaging regularly to ensure that we are solving your most immediate problems. So we have a whole regular cadence of engagements and activities for our employers. And on the educator side of the house, we offer all sorts of supports. So as you are mapping knowledge, skills, and abilities into your curriculum, we're with you every step of the way. Um, again, there's enough work to go around on this one. And so we welcome new partners engaging in this um, and also new partners who help us think about this differently uh, because the world is changing so very quickly right now as we think about talent development and workforce development. Um, and we don't wanna have just the same voices around the table because you'll end up crafting the same solutions. And, and we know that we've been trying to craft the same solutions for a long time and they haven't always worked. And so thinking really hard about this and pivoting when we need to is equally as important. And that means having diverse partners at the table who push us, who ask us hard questions, and then who are willing to be there to help us solve these problems. So thank you, Jane, for asking that question, because yes, we always love more friends. Um, there's there's plenty, plenty of room in this work. Well, you know, my measure of success is gonna be, can we replicate this model across the country? Certainly we are an area that's so blessed with so many great institutions of higher ed, but look at Ohio, look at the Pacific Northwest, look at Philadelphia. I mean, people, New England, I mean, every part of the country could be doing this again, based upon the specific needs of their regional employers and the agility of their institutions. So I want, the next time I talk to you, Jeannie, I want you to tell me that I caused a nightmare for you because all these other parts of the country are calling you saying, how do we do this? I love it, I live for nightmares. That would well, be such a wonderful challenge. This has been so great. I hope everyone watching goes to your website and I hope you'll agree to come back. Maybe the next time we'll do a little panel for a longer time and get some of the employers and some of the students on. That would be really fun. You're not getting rid of me. Please, please stay close, Jane. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Jane. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you're going to think this, this particular session was your favorite of the Acceleration Summit, and you're going to be right. But I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit, and I hope you'll join me in thanking Jeannie for such a great session. Thank you for having me. It was really fun.